Amen. Praise the Lord. Please let's be seated and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 10. We are looking at eligible candidates for eternal redemption. There are many people who say they are Christians. But if you were to talk about being born again, they'll be confused like Nicodemus. There are many people who say they are born again. But they cannot really be soundly sure that if the trumpet sounds now, they'll be among the redeemed. Because they've not taken time to consider how serious eternal redemption is. You know, you hear people on the street, they say, you tell them something, they say, that's not a big deal. You tell them another thing, they say, oh, that's not a big deal. I come to tell you today, eternal redemption is a big deal. It is a big deal. In Mark chapter 10, verse 26, and they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Who then can be saved? That was a statement of astonishment. The disciples were astonished out of measure. When Jesus announced what would have appeared self-evident to all the people, that it is hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. They did not appear to have been shocked because something has preempted that statement. They did not appear to have been shocked that Jesus Christ offered the man opportunity to enter, which the rich man promptly rejected. They did not appear to have been shocked at that. Because that's a big deal that God himself speaks to you directly and offers you. You asked him a question. He gave you the answer and gave you the right answer. And you rejected it out of hand. Christ's statement obviously had some bearing with the disciples also for them to be astonished and then ask the question in their heart, who then can be saved? Why? Because all men desire wealth. And of course, at different levels, there are some that just need a few hundred dollars and they feel to make a difference in their life. There are some that just need a few thousand dollars and they feel to make a difference in their life. There are some that just, uh, that just need a few million dollars, you know, uh, that, and feel that will make a difference in, your, in their life. There are some that have to have a billion. Otherwise, they're in trouble. You see, different levels of need are there, even among the disciples of Jesus Christ, even among churchgoers, even among sound Christians. You see, the rich man felt he has, he has everything anyone on earth would desire and now needed assurance of eternity that he knew he did not have. Getting saved before dead or personal rapture is, a fundament is fundamentally important. 
Nothing else in life is more important than that. Because that's when you enter. But after you enter, you must stay in. Getting saved before that all, personal rapture is fundamentally important. Staying saved and fruitful is heaven's universal requirement for everyone that is saved. Finishing saved at the time you die, at the time you are raptured, saved. Finishing saved is a mandatory goal for all humanity. God wants everybody saved. All can be saved regardless of their crime. You've heard us say that before, but it's worth repeating. All can be saved regardless of their crimes, of their sins, of their wickedness. How do we know that? Grace makes it possible for all to be saved. How do we know that? God's love makes it possible for all to be saved. But all must personally, personally come themselves like this rich man did. They must come themselves. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 tells us that by grace are ye saved through faith. Not of yourself, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Not of yourself. Not of works. Not something you can just drum up. The scripture again says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to die for the sins of the world. That none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the same scripture tells us how we approximate that grace and love that God has put together for us. It says in Romans chapter 10 verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's why this morning I want to talk to us on the events that led to that statement, that surround that statement that we just read, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verse 28. And we want to look at three things. Number one, search for the Redeemer and his redemption. Some search sincerely, some very insincere. Some just assume that because they are who they are, that God should bow to them. But God will not change the standard. And that's why we'll talk on the sorrow of rejected rebels before we finish on the sacrifice and redemption rewards. Praise the Lord. And so as we go back to Mark chapter 10, the Gospel of Mark chapter 10, we want to back up from uh, uh, introducing text all the way to verse 17. Verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And uh, he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. 
that one thing happens to be the foundation to the building. One thing thou lackest, and that one thing you cannot buy with money. One thing thou lackest, and that one thing you've ignored all this time, you've acquired wealth. One thing thou lackest, that which you really need, if you're ever going to enter into life or see life, one thing thou lackest, go thy way. Sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. He lacks treasure in heaven. And come, take up thy cross and follow me. Let's talk about that for a moment before we see what the rich man's response was to the instruction regarding the one thing that he lacked. In verse 17, you notice there, for those of you that do some deeper studies, that the translation in the KJV gives us five things the man did that looks really spiritual. Looks like somebody that was ready for eternity. But you know, some people go to church, but they are not looking forward to be saved. Some people look, look to God, but they are not willing for God to tell them how to live their life. They still want to be in church. One thing thou lackest. But let's get to this verse 17. And you notice here, number one, he came. He made a decision to come to Jesus. Number two, he was running. There came one running. Number three, he kneeled down before Christ. Number four, he showed reverence. He showed respect. He called him good master. And number five, he asked. He asked for eternal life. For what he should do to inherit eternal life. He's been around religion long enough to know that you don't buy it with money. You inherit it. So he asked to inherit. And when he was come, and when he was gone forth in, into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? He was not ashamed of the crowd, uh, even though he was a rich man. The last rich man that did this, oh, well, well, may not be the last. The, uh, another rich man that did this, his name is Zacchaeus, he got saved. Another rich man that came and called Jesus good master, which you know, another translation is good teacher, is Nicodemus. He called him a teacher come from God. He got saved. This man did this and made the request and it sounded like someone that has been deep in Christianity. He was deep in religion. He knows there is eternity in heaven. He wants it now that he's comfortable on earth. But maybe this man is a little too comfortable on earth. By his question, he acknowledges that he does not have hope in eternity, even though he observed all the moral law from his youth. His own mouth said it. He says, what should I do to have it? He asks for something he doesn't have. 
Notice in verse 18 that Jesus dissociates himself and declines the rich man's diplomatic compliment. Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. If you regard me as God, then you're on your way to eternity. But if you say that not what I'm going to tell you, if you reject what I'm going to tell you, there is no hope for you. It reminds him also that the question he's asking, he actually knows the answer. But does not want to accept all the answer as a whole. The man is playing games. The commandments that the rich man boasted of keeping from his youth are laws that most people in the world observe also. Verse 19. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Does everybody commit adultery? I want to hear you, church. No. Do not steal. Is everybody in the world a thief? The way we know it? Do not kill. Does everybody kill? Are you all murderers? No. Do not bear false witness. Do you lie? All the time. You see, you couldn't answer that. That, cor that cor cuts too deep. Do you go around defrauding people? No. And I can testify this of you because I know you. You honor your father and your mother. I don't need uh, Western Union to give me the data of how much you send to them. I know you honor your father and your mother. Don't you? Hello? Was that something that you started doing when you were born, when, after you got born again, or you've been doing that from your youth? You've been doing that from your youth? Wow. What claim does this man have on God now? The commandments that the rich man boasted of keeping from his youth are laws that most people in the world observe too. Can you imagine a world that everyone commits adultery, everyone steals, everyone kills, everyone lies, etc.? Everyone is a 419, a fraudster. Can you imagine that world? You go to work dressed up, and your employer will not only pay you, but take your clothes off you. That's how bad it could get. Can you imagine the world that everybody does all of that? Can you imagine if all kill? And so, if that is all you can accomplish as a Christian, that's all you can tell somebody. I don't steal. I don't kill. I don't defraud. And that's what makes you a Christian. Please, I'm begging you, you are not a Christian. Because there is nothing that you have that is of grace. You did not get it from God. It's the natural instinct in man. The morality of man that has been operating in your life. If that is all you can accomplish as a Christian, what has grace done for you? You know, acts without the grace of God obviously is not from God. Acts of, uh, without the grace of Christ are without holiness and purity of heart and keeps you a sinner still. You notice it's Jesus that is telling him this. 
And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. But he is not a careful student of the word. Because if he was, he would have noticed that Jesus left out a chunk out of that commandment that he gave him. He left he just through the moral law that they pride themselves in, Pharisees and all that. And the man was like, wow, you mean I'm, I'm all set? And Jesus said, no, I told you about the tilings on the roof. We need to deal with the foundation." So Jesus and Christ excluded the first and great commandment, three major things. The first and great commandment and uh, uh, covetousness and idolatry. He didn't talk about that. Because wealth, riches, money was this man's idol. Covetousness has swallowed him up. He walked and smelled covetousness. You know? And to break, how do you break from covetousness? You start giving away. Just give out. You know? Idolatry was there. Covetousness was there. And when those are there, you cannot love God with all your mind, with all your strength, with everything about you. Praise the Lord. Before we rush off, do you have that verse 19 in your Bible? Mark chapter 10 verse 19. Look at that verse carefully. Look at that verse carefully. Which of those things do you need to lose something for you to do it? What do you sacrifice to observe verse 19? What do you let go? What do you lose? You do not lose anything to observe verse 19. It calls for no sacrifice. And there are yet many Christians that feel that their lives should be bed of roses. They have nothing to sacrifice. For the glory of the Savior. Nothing. And yet, they think they are saved. And so, the man is bold enough to say he has observed all this from his youth. The rich man told Jesus Christ, who could see the state of his soul clearly, right in front of him, that he was okay by the standard of the law. And the glorious Logos was standing in front of him. In front of him. Why? He was blinded. He ignored his lack of fear of God. He ignored his lack of love for God. He ignored his lack of service to God. He ignored his lack of faith in God. He ignored his, his lack of trust in God. And like Nicodemus, unlike Nicodemus, he never took correction. But like Nicodemus, he needed regeneration. And so, after telling the Lord that he was okay, then Jesus, beholding him, verse 21, loved him and uh, said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven which you don't have, and come and take off thy cross and follow me. That's always the sticky part. Jesus loves all sinners, loves to save their souls, he loves them enough to die for them. He saw the lack of the rich man's soul and pointed to it. He had lived, the rich man has lived a selfish life. One thing thou lackest. With all his acquisition, there was one thing 
And he himself knew it. That's why he came to Jesus. The source of life and the blessings in eternity. You see, good works preceded by salvation must be followed by cross-carrying and uh, following Jesus all the way. That is discipleship. He had no treasure in heaven where he desired to be. All his treasures were here on earth and he cannot carry them with him. The cross of Christ will prove to be too heavy while you carry all the earthly treasures. Follow Christ here and now to have hope of eternity. The rich man got the answer to his question. How did he handle it? What did he do following that? You see, some are not sincere when they ask for the way to life. You would think that the way Cain was angry that God disrespected his offering, his sacrifice, you would think if God sent a little boy to tell him, thus says the Lord, that he will act in line. If God sent a prophet to tell him, thus says the Lord, he will definitely, if God sent his son to tell him, thus says the Lord, he will obey. God himself came to tell Cain, to talk with Cain. Look at it. On what to do to be accepted. Genesis 4 verse 5. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, why are you wroth and uh, why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou dost not well... You know what? You can correct it. Sin lied at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. What did Cain do following that? He killed Abel. He didn't do what God asked him to do. He did what Satan asked him to do. You see, the rich man's initial attitude were good, but he could not follow through because of the deceitfulness of riches. Just like Cain. He brought offering to the Lord also, just like his younger brother Abel did. But Abel followed that which God had required. And he did not. And even though God himself came to correct him, he refused correction. He decided to just do things his own way. How could he have responded? He should have responded with sincerity. Like Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, Luke chapter 19, ran. Ran. He wasn't announcing, I want eternal life, I want eternal life, I want eternal life. He said, I just want to see him, see how he, what he looks like. I've never met him. And Zacchaeus ran and climbed on the tree. And Jesus got to the tree in the road, in, by the road of Jericho, like the road in Jericho. And when he, once he got there, you never knew that God was waiting for you. You never knew that God was searching for you. You thought you are the one that was looking for God. He got to the tree that Zacchaeus was. He stopped right there and lifted up his eyes. Zacchaeus, make haste, come down. How did Zacchaeus respond? Jesus said, it's today. I want to have lunch in your house. Zacchaeus, he told Jesus, um, can we make it next week? You know, my schedule is really tight today. That's what Zacchaeus told Jesus. No. He made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And on that same occasion, committed to restitution. Those are sincere people looking for the Lord. 
Those are sincere people wanting salvation. And that's why Jesus pronounced in that house that not only Zacchaeus will be saved, the whole house is taken. And that's how, and that's, and that's why, and that's why Jesus made that big statement in Zacchaeus' house that he has come to seek and to save that which was lost. How could he have responded like Nicodemus? Reference earlier. He could have responded like Nicodemus and tell uh, 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 the Lord, uh, even though, you know, this man is of high status, possibly older than the Lord. He just started saying, he went to the Lord in the night. He's a Pharisee, either for security reason or to give the Lord time to be able to spend with him because People are always around him during the day. He went in the night and just began to say, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do all these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus just stopped him right there. Big man, interrupted by the rabbi. And he was okay, just okay with that. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see. See, you don't know what it looks like. You're just teaching the Jews, you're teaching everybody, a teacher yourself, but you don't know what real redemption looks like. And uh, the man was full of confusion to be born from above. How can a man be born when he is old? Will he enter into the mother's womb? Jesus repeated it again. Okay, in case you don't understand. I mean regeneration except a man be born of water, the word of God, and of the spirit, the Holy Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's the spirit of God that puts you in there using the word of God to cleanse your heart and cleanse your life up. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And he continued to talk to him. He says, marvel not that I say ye must be born again. You, I'm talking about you, Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He said, but I'm pastor. Yes, you must be born again. You haven't been. I'm bishop. Yes, you must be born again. You haven't been. I'm walker. Yes, you must be born again. You haven't been. I'm coordinator. Yes, you must be born again. You haven't been. I'm in charge of this, in charge of that. Yes, you must be born again. I can sing. Yes, you must be born again. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? And Jesus preached to him till verse 21. The next time we hear of Nicodemus is in chapter 7 of John, defending the Lord Jesus Christ. You know the man is born again. It's when you are born again that you are ready to stick out your neck, even if they're going to cut it off for your master. And the next, after that, we hear of him. is out in John chapter 19 that he teams up with Joseph of Arimathea to properly prepare the body and bury him after the crucifixion. How could this rich man have responded? He could have responded like the 3,000 people in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. They had mangled up. They received it. Verse 36, chapter 2 of Acts. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Jesus you kill, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They did. Three thousand of them came in. Praise the Lord. Amen. 
How could this rich man have responded? He could have responded like the Philippi jailer did. The Philippi jailer at midnight, Paul and Silas, they prayed, they sang, and the Holy Ghost came down. That's uh, the chorus, okay. In Acts chapter 16, Yes, they could have responded like these people. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, it, 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 there were things before that indeed they could lay hold to be able to respond properly. In Acts chapter 16 verse 29, then he called for a light and sprang it and came trembling and fell down uh, before Paul and Silas and brought them out uh, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake the word unto him. They spake uh, unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in the house. And he took them the same night, same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and, and was baptized. He, and uh, he, and all his, straightway. How could this man have responded? He could have responded like Cornelius. 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 A man of high status. He had done a lot of good with his wealth. A certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, the centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, and uh, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. And he saw in a vision. And God himself sent an angel to go and tell him what to do to get saved. He did. Peter went. He spake. The man received. Peter got in trouble for it. And explaining himself for getting in trouble, he said in chapter 11, verse 14, Who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? That's all Peter was supposed to go there to do. When he did, Holy Ghost came down. They had Pentecost like they had themselves in Jerusalem. Verse 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then had God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life, unto eternal life. Yes, he has. That's how the man could have responded. But that's not how. He responded. In Mark chapter 10, verse 22. And that brings me to point number two. Sorrow of rejected rebels. In Acts chapter 10, verse 22. And he was sad. And he was what? He was sad. And he was what? Many of you don't can answer, are you sad? That you have to let go so much? You have so much that you must set aside and get eternity first? And he was sad at that saying because Jesus told him one thing he lacked and how to fix that lack. He was sad at that saying and went away grieved. For he had great possessions. The sadness for this man is that he ignored his status. Rich men don't make sincere friends. They have many friends. But many of them are not sincere. Rich men don't Provide easy access to their heart, even to their person. You call the rich man, the secretary picks up and start dancing you around in circles. You try to visit the rich man, the security asks you, can I help you? 
any access you seek to a rich man, particularly if you say, I just want to give him this tract. <laughs> the security doesn't need permission from the rich man. It will just, listen, if you don't get away from here now. He knows he's not exposed to the gospel. And he had this chance with the master. And he was not happy. And Jesus looked around about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at this word, at his words, astonished. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trusts, that trusts, Trust in riches. That trust in riches. That's the problem. That trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. They trust in riches more than they trust in God. So, the acquired time is to check the account balance. Because they trust in riches. The acquired time is not to read the Bible and let God speak to them. It's not to cry out to God and worship God. And the disciples, sorry, that trust in riches, the kingdom of God, verse 25, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. The imagery in verse 25, you are familiar with that, the eye of the needle. And uh, they were astonished out of measure. See how many times they have to talk about these disciples being astonished. This time they are astonished out of measure because maybe they thought when Christ said it the first time it was a slip of tongue. So when Christ repeated it, now they are astonished out of measure. Saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Who then can be saved? And Jesus looking upon them said, would men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. The rich man should take a string and tie this vest to his waist. The publican should take a string and tie this vest to his waist. Anywhere they go. And somebody that hasn't read the Bible carefully tells them, you are too rich to be in heaven. They will show them the verse. You know, uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 27 says, yes, it is possible. Amen? Praise the Lord. Remember, the rich man's access to life-saving life -saving message is significantly limited by their lifestyle. How many people in America, you know, uh, that are rich? are in the church every Sunday crying out to God. In fact, how many of them can remember the last time they cried? Except maybe a family member died that they really liked or something. What intimidates the rich man? Think about that for a moment. He knows that his exposure to the gospel is limited. He knows that he can get nothing eternal from the Pharisees. He knows that the Pharisees offer him no hope. To miss one opportunity may be costly in eternity. And yet, he was sad and grieved because of his great possession. He could not even stop to think of Christ's offer. He did not even make pretensions about it. Okay, sir, um, let me go think about it. I'll be back. He didn't do that. He just turned. He said, uh, no, I can't handle that. And left. And when he left... I know it's only concerning Judas that the scripture says it was night. When this man left, it was night to his soul. He rejected it outright. 
great offer from the great God proved too little for his great possessions. What God was giving him was greater than all his possessions, but in his eyes, they were not up to par. They did not measure to his great possession. He never heard of Job, who possibly was richer than him. That's why the scripture says in Isaiah chapter 30 verse 1. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me. And that cover with a covering, but not by my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. The sin of being rude to the Savior, to the Redeemer. He tells you, this is what you do. And you look at him, and you look at your bank account, and you turn and say, no, no, I, 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 I hear you another time. Or you say like the king, almost thou persuaded me to be a Christian. But at least in the case of the king, he sent for Paul so frequently, this man never came back. Earthly possessions are only great in human eyes. You know that, right? You know the reason I know that? Of the many angels that are around here on earth, personal angels to believers, the ones that God sent on special missions and so on and so forth, none of them get here and they say, can I get a job in Wall Street? They don't want it. In fact, they are generally always in a hurry to leave. It must be stinking here. Not one angel comes to say, can I get one of those mansions in Hollywood? Not one. But Lucifer will lie and blind people with that. Earthly possessions are only great in human eyes. Eyes have not Seen the great thing God has for his people. The eyes of human, sinful humans, eyes that have not perceived glory, they cannot appreciate eternal things, spiritual things. And that's why when you see people like in the church, and they're, they're not really spiritual, they're not, they're not being cleansed, and so on and so forth. They treat everything we do as offhand. They can do anything, they can talk when the sermon is going on, they can uh, check their emails and check their uh, uh, text messages and do this and do that and go to the bathroom a hundred times. They have no reverence for God because they cannot perceive the glory, the glory, the glory. <laughs> their eyes are blinded to it. You know, sometimes we have a service. And somebody that is really not in Christ just want to hold a microphone in the church to, so that you can go out there and boast that. Ah, they, they gave me the microphone. And before you even tell the person to stand over there, oh, they jump on the pole and, they, and they're like rascals. <laughs> like, look at this person. Do they know that God is here? Do they know? You see, the eyes that have not seen glory They can't appreciate the things that God has for his children. A minister was asked the question, why is it that God would allow his children to suffer lack and so on and so forth? And the man, without missing a beat, turned around and said, because he has something better for his children. Because First Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9 tells us, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Notice, for them that love him. You 
It's not that the rich man cannot be saved and preserved for eternity. The choices they make blocks them from life. They trust in riches. And that trust in riches offends God. Not many people can handle the distractions of riches. That's why in the Bible it's like there are few of them that God just like give them freelance to be wealthy. Because they could handle it. But many, you see a lot pursuing, pursuing, pursuing. They cannot handle wealth. You get $100,000 in their hand, they leave the Bible. They'll go get themselves busy with something else. Because, you see, riches fans your ego. Riches provide you with artificial glory. Even those that hate you, when they see you, they speak to you with respect. Perchance they can get something from you. And because riches fans their ego, the pride hinders them. Riches silences their prayer life. When they were young, they could ask God for money to pay Con Edison, utility, and their rentals, and whatever. Now they can easily afford that. That, that was 90% of their prayer life for their need. When God took care of that, they forgot God. Because that was 90% of their prayer. And so, beloved, the danger of riches, it deceives, silences your prayer life. The prayerlessness that it throws them into plagues them all the days of their life. It makes you suspect or makes you accuse your neighbors of laziness and source of wealth uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and their source of wealth are not always honest. Majority of the billionaires and multi-millionaires and so-called even thousandaires, you should go and see how they made the money. Don't be surprised if you find a lot of blood flowing. Some of them have killed so much they could create a river with the blood. But they go around boasting that they are wealthy. It makes you accuse your neighbor of laziness. That's false accusation. Have you heard politicians say, we're not going to, well, there's no handout here. We're not going to give this to the poor. How did you get your money? If those people that you are refusing to take care of decide to act like you, they will kill you in order to be rich. So, you better take care of the poor. Because the poor ye have always. Better still, better do honor to God with your wealth. Praise the Lord. You see, the rich, they do not trust God. They do not trust his word as they trust their bank statements. You see, Abraham came to wealth and he made it. In Genesis chapter 13 verse 2 tells us this man was rich. And Abraham, and Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold, the standard of wealth for his time. So, the God of Abraham is ready to bless you. But don't be a fool. Like this rich man. Boaz, the Bible tells us, was a man of great wealth. Ruth chapter 2, verse 1. And Naomi had a king's man of her husbands, a mighty man of wealth. Think about that. 
Boaz. Because he feared God with his wealth, God led him to marry somebody that was going to be ancestor to Christ. The whole family packed in there. Boaz. Job was rich and holy. In chapter 1 of Job, we're introduced to this wonderful man. There was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And they were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. And his substance also was 7,000. And they list everything down there. Verse 4. Uh, you know. And his sons went to party. They were rich. His sons didn't have to work. And so on and so forth. And they went on and went on. What the Bible, the writer of this, the scripture tells us about Job in verse 1, okay, is what God tells Satan about Job in verse 8. Look at this. Job in verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job? He calls him his servant. That there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man. One that feared God and eschewed evil. He doesn't even talk about his wealth. It's Satan who is envious that now brings that in. Okay? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? Is because he's wealthy? Has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house? You protect everything he has and about all that he has on every side. And has blessed the work of his hands. God knew that. But that's all Satan can do but slender. Praise the Lord. Job was rich and made it. God walked with him. God stood with him. God protected him. God delivered him. God gave him grace back then, before Christ came, to endure and persevere and triumph over Satan. Praise the Lord. Are you next? You triumph over Satan. Praise the Lord. And so, the same thing with the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. God sent Philip. Philip. A stranger to this Ethiopian eunuch. He could have told him to stay away from my chariots. He could have ignored him. He could have told him to leave him alone when he heard him read from Isaiah or he could have pretended he understood what he was reading. Like some of us pretend and don't ask questions. The Philip ran up there. Understand it thou what thou readest? How can I understand? This thing is deep. And God took it from there. The long and short. He started from the passage of the scripture in Isaiah that he read, preached Christ to him, and they ran into a body of water. I said, look at water. From what you were saying, I need to be baptized. He said, if you believe, I believe with all my heart, Jesus is the son of God. He said, that's, not, that's it, that's it. He got baptized. The Ethiopian eunuch is going to pinch himself in heaven and say, this rich man, how foolish can you be? Ah, Philip preached to me, and I got saved. The son of God told you what to do. And you went to hell. Jesus says it is possible for the rich and anybody to be saved. We must believe that concerning 
our family. Because this is family forum today. We must believe that and assure our hearts. If we turn to God, he will receive us. We must believe that concerning ourselves, concerning our families, concerning this nation. Amen? When we do, the Lord will be gracious with us. The Lord will be merciful unto us. And the Lord will grant us an entrance into his heavenly kingdom in Jesus' name. Look at it. He wants everybody to be saved, rich, poor, politician, whatever you are, polarizing figures, you can be saved. I exhort therefore. Therefore. This is why we do Sunday 8.30. Don't miss it. We want everybody coming, pounding heaven. Because there's a blessing inside it. You'll be blessed. I'm expecting you tonight. Attendance has been increasing, increasing, increasing. Thank God for our leaders and so on and so forth. But let's keep, keep firing until the rain explodes all over the land. Right now, all we see is suffering all over the land. Poverty, dead, all kinds of crises. The Lord will solve the problem of this nation. I exhort therefore that first of all, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. So pray for the king's salvation and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Who will have all men to be what? To be saved. Everybody in your family, everybody in the nation, everybody in your place of work, God wants them saved. Be an instrument in the hand of God for their salvation. Amen? Praise the Lord. And then he addresses Timothy for the rich. Charge them. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world. Not rich in the other one. Charge them that are rich in this world. Real wealth is that you are rich here and you are rich there. Very few. Very few. That are rich here and rich there. And some are so wise that because they know the distractions that come with riches, they just leave that alone and they consecrate and they are eunuchs until they make heaven. I don't know what choice you are going to make. But if the things of this world are the things that make you lose eternity, there are too many people in heaven that will call you a fool. I don't even have to call you. Seriously. The Ethiopian, you know, will be like, are you kidding me? I will travel all the way on a horse. All the way from all the way to Middle East. And I've been doing that year after year and it was this particular year God had mercy on me. And you had it preached to you Sunday after Sunday, Sunday after Sunday, Sunday after Sunday, Sunday after Sunday, Sunday after Sunday. And all you do is I hope it gets to point number three. I'll get there very soon. That's Francis' time too. Okay. And so you see, the truth is this. He said, charge them. Warn them. Compel them. Mandate them. That are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, which giveth, giveth us richly all things to enjoy that they do good that they do good you know one of the first things that rich people do is slight the minister talk carelessly about the minister criticize the minister they use the standard of the world to measure the minister uh, that's not wise that's not wise that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves 
a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. The man was asking for eternal life. And Jesus told him what to do. And he said no. And Paul is telling Timothy. And Timothy that is already spiritual is not kicking back. He accepts it. I pray the Lord that we too will confirm that the glory of Christ will be a pursuit every day of our lives in Jesus' name. He says, and Jesus looking upon them said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. There is hope for all that make effort to obey Christ. Struggling, it's like, why can't I be perfect? And we're singing, have you noticed two years ago, it's like there was no Sunday. They didn't give us, the choir didn't give us that, oh, to be like this, to sing. And I instantly ignored it. I know somebody needed to pray that prayer for himself. But they don't want to pray for themselves, that prayer. They'll make us all sing it. No. You are the one that needs to be like Jesus Christ. No, just teasing. We all need to be like Jesus Christ. Amen? Can I, can I hear you, amen? Praise the Lord. You are happy just to be like Christ, isn't it? Amen? And then check up on love. Check up on your purity. Check up on your humility. Check up on your meekness. Check up on your understanding of the scripture. Check up how you live every day. Because it's not a Sunday, Sunday thing. And in that day, thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee, though thou wast angry with me. Thine anger is torn away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall ye say, praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted, sing unto the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Praise the Lord. And that brings us finally. Remember I told you it was, was who's uh, rounding up time? Okay. Sacrifice and redemption reward. Sacrifice and redemption reward. You know, this thing still bothered the apostles, the disciples to the point that they needed to be sure for themselves who then can be saved. It, because Jesus kept repeating it and they're like, are you for real? They were astonished out of measure. And so, now in verse 28, they go, then Peter began to say unto him, lo, we have left all and have followed thee. Are we any mercy left for us? And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters, sisters uh, or father or mother or wife or uh, children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and uh, uh, children and uh, lands with persecutions that go with it. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. The rich gets persecuted, particularly if he's a believer. And in the world to come, what does he get? That's what the rich man ignored. Then the Lord said, But many that are first shall be last and the last first. Before we pray, I'm going to have to unpack that verse 31. But before we get to verse 31, let me show you something in Psalm 50 verse 5. Psalm number 50 verse 5. The apostles had left all 
and followed the Lord. Amen? Is, it, is God creating a different standard for them than for other people? Is that what it is? No. He expects every true believer to have left the world. No, seriously. We handle those things in the world with a loose hand. Somebody wants to knock it off. You say, you don't need to knock, just take it. What's the big deal? In Psalm 50 verse 5, gather, the Lord says, gather my sins together unto me. Who are these sins? Those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. I see their sacrifice. That is the seal of their covenant with me. And so, they are the ones that you will gather to me. Eternity. So, you see, some sacrifice all. To make it all. To make it, anybody, to make it all must sacrifice their recommended and mandated all. What is all to you may be different from what is all to me. What you have to sacrifice may be different from what I have to sacrifice. But all sacrifice. That's a seal of the covenant. You see, some have not started the journey at all. even though they are in and out of Christian circles. That's the case with this rich man. He never entered life, let alone qualify for eternal life. What must I do that I may inherit eternal life? He never entered it. You see, the gate you enter is straight. The way you walk is narrow. The gate defines the road. If you enter any other gate that gives you freedom for that and that and that, you miss the real gate. Because the gate is straight. The road is narrow. Translated properly, both of them, narrow. Narrow gate, narrow road. And so this man never really entered. Even though he said that all these have I observed from my youth. He lacked something. Some started the race but cannot continue. Like Demas in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. They started, he started, and Paul was excited to show him the ropes of ministry. He left. For Demas has forsaken me, says Paul. Having loved this present world. He left. He started. He could not continue. Some started, continued, but cannot get to the finish line. And that brings to mind Achan. Achan, Joshua. Chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God. The Lord God of Israel. And thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment. Ah, that took me. Achan. He started the journey. He came out of Egypt, typology of our salvation. 
endured nearly 40 years in the wilderness. They are the gate of Canaan. The first city that at the border of Canaan that they must bring down the wall. Achan. Started, continued. Got to the finish line or could not get into Canaan. Could not get in. They killed him with his entire family at the borders of Canaan. Some started, continued, got to the finish line, finished. They cut the tape like in a race, like the case of Stephen. In Acts chapter 7, verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, is rounding off his preaching now. Shegun style. Full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven. And saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Stephen, he saw the finish line. He saw the Lord saying, it is finished. You finished your ministry. Thus far, I created you for this moment. You can seal it. Go ahead, seal it with your blood. He said, behold... I see heaven opened and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness laid down their clothes at the young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He crossed the line. He went in and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their church. He had freedom in the spirit that the murder, that the killing wasn't ending him. It was immediately translating him to glory. He has crossed the line. He has seen the other side. He was hearing the redemption song sung across the bridge on the other side. And he could at peace forgive his murderers. Lord, lay not this sin to their church. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He did not die. He fell asleep. He made it across the line. Moses sacrificed so much in order to cross the line. Hebrews 11 tells us that verses 24 to 26, he forsook the throne for Christ. Joseph saw and crossed the finished line and gave commandment concerning his bones. He said, surely the Lord will fulfill his word to my great-grandfather taking you back to Palestine, to Canaan. And when you are going, remember to take my bones. He finished. He tested eternity. He went over. He crossed the finish line. Hebrews eleven twenty two. Abraham gave up Mesopotamia. And was willing to give up Isaac, the same Hebrews 11. He crossed the line. 
he finished. He went to the other side. Ruth gave up Moab. And she mourned the deity of Moab. He finished. She finished. She came to the other side. Rahab gave up a profitable, sinful profession. Prostitution. She finished. She made it to the ancestry of Christ. The woman at the well looking for real drinking water gave up sinful religious lifestyle. She finished. She brought the city to Christ. Let me ask you, what did you drop off when you got saved? Did you drop anything? Did anything change? Was there any change? Was there any change? Because, you know, I promised you I was going to comment on verse 31 of that Mark 10. Where it says that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And that is not God making a decision by fear that somebody that started the race and has been running faithfully will be yanked and put as the last. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. And he's saying in these, on the instant of the rich man that rejected eternity. And he has also said that on the instant of the master that hired laborers for his vineyard and paid them the same penny a day that he paid those that were hired early in the morning, third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour, and the eleventh hour. He paid them the same thing. And those that were hired earlier in the day had problems with that. And he questioned with them and said, can't I do what I want to do with my own? So the last shall be first and the first last. For many are called, but few chosen. And here is this last first and first last. You know, rich people and powerful people in authority, they are prominent here on earth. They are easily recognized and honored here on earth. Anywhere they go, they give them seat first. If you go to a place, any function you attend, and you're not the governor of the state, if the governor of the state shows up after they seated you in the front row, what do you think they're going to do to you? Uh, sir, please. The sir is not compared to the sir that they call the governor. So if you respect yourself, before they come, sir, you quickly get up. Why don't you let the governor come sit over here? The people, what Christ is saying is that the ones that are first here on earth, prominent here, will be last or nothing. Prominent on earth, but insignificant and zero in heaven. You see, angels rejoice when somebody gets saved. Angels don't celebrate when a thousand year makes a billion. They don't. Disciples, the disciples' worth must not be compared with the sacrifice of others. It had bothered me why, why it's like uh, Joshua is going to get the same this thing as Moses. Ministries differ. They are in the same ministry. In fact, in Hebrews 11, you notice Joshua's uh, military campaign is listed under Moses. Joshua's name is not mentioned. But the thing is this. For me and you, what God expects from us in the ministry is different. You are, I cannot make your contribution for you. You don't know that. But I'm telling you. 
you have to be ready to make your contribution. And not be distracted by those with big megaphones, by those with apparent success, by those with mega churches. You just faithfully do your own. That may be your God's willing, God's will, and God's calling in this life. You miss that because you're looking at and competing with and being jealous of somebody else. You miss the purpose of God for your life. And that's how. The first shall be last and the last first. All those that will be, that are last now and will be first, are all that will fulfill their God-given calling. The disciples, therefore, must not measure his worth or compare his worth with the sacrifice of others. Moses did that. God gave him everything to do that. That other minister has that other bigger ministry. And you're supposed to be sitting on a second chair. The second chair may just be for a period of time, but so be it. Be happy about it. Celebrate it. Do it faithfully. The Lord give you grace and revelation. Praise the Lord. Focus on serving him with a pure heart. Fulfill God's will for yourself. Fulfill God's will for yourself. Doing God's perfect will is the most important thing for you. It is the most important thing. Whether it's small or great, it must be done perfectly. God requires it that way. You remember John the Baptist. To prepare the way. His ministry was what? To prepare the way for the Lord. They came telling him, look at, everybody's going to Christ's baptism. Hey, do something about it. He said, no, he must increase and I must decrease. I told you already, I know where my ministry starts and where my ministry ends. And when they threw him in jail and he knew that most of the people, a king jails like that, they killed them. He sent to Jesus Christ. Are you the one or do I need to come out and continue preparing for the Messiah? And he got up and showed the Messianic miracles and sent them back to prison to tell John, tell him what you have seen and heard. And John was content for his head to be cut off by the, at the instruction of a woman. Think about it. It takes grace to finish ministry at the point God wants you to finish it. You know that, right? It takes real grace. It takes grace to serve God, particularly when you're serving him at a, a lower level. It takes grace to really be an effective person sitting on a second chair. Maybe you should go and buy that book. It's a book sitting on a second chair. It's a book on leadership. So you know how to humble yourself. And like John the Baptist, fulfill your ministry. You couldn't compare. Yes, Judah and Jerusalem, they all went out to John's baptism in the wilderness at, at, uh, at River Jordan. But when Christ came on the scene, he decreased. And uh, uh, you don't hear him saying things to contradict what Christ is teaching. Even if it uproots or corrects what he thought. Seriously. It takes real wisdom and grace. It's because he knew what his ministry really was. Some don't. You see, some prophets, some pastors, some preachers, some apostles, they are called. Some are sent by people. Some just packed their things and went. They just met themselves. Know which one is you. You see, Elijah was a premier prophet. He's presented as a model of prophets as David is presented as model of a king, a godly king. But Elisha asked for a double portion. Elisha did exactly twice the number of miracles Elijah did. Elisha is bigger than Elijah? No, not at all. <laughs> they just fulfilled their individual ministry. Andrew brought Peter in. 
The Lord needed Peter for the leadership of the early church. And you have to like peel like the pages of the New Testament to find Andrew after that. Where is he mentioned? Sometimes they will start listing some apostles after, 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 outside of the uh, uh, Gospels and it's like they forget to mention Andrew. Seriously. And you're like, what's up with this? He did his job. He did his job. He went straight to his point of service. His point of service was Peter. He's his older brother. He has to tell him, I am in. I see the water is clean. You can come in with me. And Peter got in. And you will get in. And you will get others in. Andrew brought Peter in. He did his. First will be last. Last. First. What would you rather be? Why not last here on earth? Cleaning the floor? Doing every sundry stuff? And first in heaven. Where are you? Who wants to adopt that position? That they will cancel you on earth here like they cancel Christ. And you are exalted up in heaven. Where are you? Can you stand with me? And then lift up your voice to God and tell the Lord. Tell the Lord what the case is with you. It's not enough to indicate verbally that you are interested in eternity in heaven. It's not enough to tell everybody around you that you are sold out to Christ. Only Jesus knows the key thing you need in your life. And he is not hiding that key thing from you. One thing thou lackest. One thing thou lackest. You know it. You know that you need to settle it with God. Now. Today. Right now. You know it. You know it. One thing thou lackest. Open your heart and mouth and tell the Lord. You see those children in your family, you think their blood will not be in your hand if you yourself escape. What of your co workers? What of your employer? What of your extended family? What of your schoolmate? What of your classmate? Is your soul secured for eternity? Does Jesus have absolute control over you? Can he tell you something to do that you will not consider too great a sacrifice? Can he show you the path you will joyfully tread? Does Jesus have rule over your soul? What will be the explanation over there that you will be able to come up with to explain how you were such a sound believer, 
such a good Christian that you could not bring a soul with you from your family. That one child you have, for the first 10 years of that child's life, he or she could not say no to you. You were a Christian all that time. You said you could not win that child for Christ. The child has grown up and now talks anti-Christian language. How can you say you've secured your soul for eternity? The spirit could not even use your example to convert the child. I'm not talking about you preaching to the child now. I'm talking about you just living that Christian life domestically. And the Lord was able to use that to convert that child, to win that child, to bless that child, to consecrate that child to himself. What's up with that kind of Christianity? Let's just take this moment and focus on our family, our lives as example, as a shining light in the family. Why do they grow up thinking that the gospel is fake? Because they did not see a domestic, a local example that was different from the public disgrace that they see from major preachers of the world. Every now and then, you hear this one has fallen. No, he hasn't just fallen. They live like that. It was just revealed to the public that they were living a double life with mega churches, with mega pulpit. What is it that you are lacking this day? That you're going to be honest with God and tell the Lord, this I know I lack. This I know is my lack. Ask the Lord for mercy while he is near. Don't hear the word of God like that. And just, all right, let's go home and continue as before. God forbid. I say God forbid. And you should say God forbid for yourself. Because the word came to cleanse, to wash us, to perfect us. To bring us to where we ought to be by the will of God. For those in eternity, though they may be counseled here on earth, rejected here on earth, they are recognized in heaven. They are the last that will be first. And all the ones that have prominence here by their wealth, They use their substance for self-glory. Some of them even use it to attack God, the church, the work of God, to destabilize the brethren, and so on and so forth. The Lord have mercy on their soul. But you, make up your mind what you want to be. The Lord has no problem in reaching his children. It's his children that have problem Handling riches. Ask Christ into your heart now. Use this occasion to make a formal request to heaven. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Direct the affairs of my life. From this day forward, I will yield the right of way to you. Make that commitment. Let heaven hear it. Let heaven know it. Let heaven document it. 
write this day down. The last day in February uh, 2021. Make it an occasion. Make it your date of birth. Make it a special encounter with the Lord. The Lord will remember you. The Lord will not forget you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you and we bless your name for your mercy and faithfulness towards all. We thank you, Father, that you are a God that knows no impossibility. Lord, I lift up all the listeners today, the ones that have logged in, the ones that are following us virtually, and following you and hearing your word. And the ones in the auditorium. Lord, I'm asking, oh God, that Father, your mercy will extend to all. That all will have their names in the book of life. In the Lamb's book of life. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, whatever it's going to take. Like you went out of the way to meet the needs of the Ethiopian eunuch. Father, whatever it's going to take. Like you went out of your way to meet the need of that Gentile. Cornelius, 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 Father, whatever it's going to take, Father, meet the need, the eternal need of every soul, the spiritual need of every soul, and the physical need of all that are gathered here, and of all that are following, oh God, virtually, in the name of Jesus Christ. Let the miracle take place in every family now. Father, register all the families represented Father, here and virtually in the book of life, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. By having their sins forgiven. By washing them through and through. By cleansing the heart. Take the rebellion away. Take the rejection of truth away. And Father, O oh Lord, turn their heart. That they may truly enjoy the wealth that you have given them. The riches that they have acquired. In the name of Jesus Christ. Show them the path of restitution. Show them the path to soundness. Show them the path to life. Bless all the families here, Lord. In Jesus' name, I've prayed. Amen. And the church said, Amen. Amen.